Welcome, everybody, and thank you so very much for um, coming this afternoon. I know we're kind of maybe getting a little bit both anxious and excited about um, the start of the term. And so just really hoping that this session today will give you some um, insights, some inspiration, and some ideas about taking care of our students in the classroom. So super excited to be here. I've got a whole team of um, my co-researchers with me on some of the projects that we've been doing, and uh, really excited to share these with you today. Um, so topic of today is embedding student well-being into your teaching practice and um, and kind of the whole idea and some of the themes that's going along with the, the CTL uh, Summer Institute is really coming back to the basics. And I think one of the, our, our most basic things um, that we need is our health and well-being. And with that, then we can thrive and uh, hopefully thrive in the academic setting. And uh, that's, you know, why all our students are coming here to UBC. And um, hopefully we can we can help them with that. So again, in, in light of this being a, a topic of well-being, I do encourage you to, wherever you are today, to stand, move around, sit, stretch, whatever you need to do, drink water while you're listening to this webinar and, and uh, taking care of you while you're, you're listening and um, interacting with this workshop. So thank you so very much. Um, all right, Alisa, let's go to the next slide and we'll do um, our, our land acknowledgement. So um, I'm coming to you, we are all coming, actually all of my presenters today are coming to you from um, the traditional ancestor and unceded territory of the Silks Okanagan people. So we're all from UBC Okanagan. And I just really want to engage in this session um, with intent um, and, and, and gratitude. And um, I think we have a, a wonderful opportunity here when we're talking about wealth and well-being. And so I really invite you to join me in working towards truth and reconciliation and strengthening the relationship we have with our host nations by all of us practicing, sharing health knowledge and skills to take care of these lands and all of the peoples as best we can. All right, next slide. <laughs> All right, so here is our agenda for today. So um, we're first going to just talk really briefly about student well-being and learning. And I know you're all here because you already know that the well-being of our students is so, so critical for their learning and their success in the academic environment. We're going to talk a little bit about the Teachers Project, which is um, a research project that we have been working on specifically looking at um, well-being um, interventions in the classroom, sharing a couple of our unique results with you. We're going to look at the dimensions of well-being so we can understand what areas can we address in the classroom. Specifically, then we're going to look um, at well-being in the classroom and uh, all of us on, on the team are going to be sharing a couple of ideas of some of the implementations that we did over the last couple of years during this research projects and, and some of our lessons learned from that. And then we want to turn it over to you to um, allow some time for discussion, questions, ideas, brainstorming to see what you might be able to do um, in your classes as we jump back in this September. And then we'll just close with some um, resources and some inspiration. So that is the plan of action. And I do just encourage you, please, um, we're trying to watch the chat, even just um, unmute and um, or put your hand up. Um, we're happy to hear questions and comments as we, we go throughout. We really want this to be more of a um, of, a, of a discussion rather than just us kind of uh, presenting away here. Now, the other thing I do want to mention as well, I'm not sure everybody who is online with us today, but, um, you know, we talk about, um, you know, this is for what student well-being in the classroom, but if there are some staff members here, some leaders here that are running meetings and, and things like that, you know, you can take some of these ideas and absolutely apply them to a meeting setting as well. And uh, so I hope um, that might help for, for some of you too. All right, next slide, please, Lisa. All right. So um, you can see lots of different uh, pictures up here. Um, we do have very strong evidence now that um, student well-being supports learning and is so, so important for that, whether it's engagement in the learning process. And if we are not well, how are we expected to learn well? And um, so that there's so much evidence out there for that now we can just, you know, we don't have to go through the rigmarole of explaining that we, we know it and it's out there. 
And um, so we really need to take action now. What can we do in our teaching and learning environments to really support the well-being of our students? And I think when we are coming um, off of the biggest sort of um, influx and impact of COVID-19, where we were, you know, together, then online and kind of a hybrid and all over the map, it really has taken on a toll on everybody's health. So faculty, staff, students, as well as our entire community. And so it's really brought in a lot of different facets, but really addressing student well-being, letting students know that we care is demonstrating to be one of the biggest things that can really support well-being and student engagement in the classroom. All right, next slide, please, Elisa. Okay, so let me explain a little bit about the Teachers Project um, to you. So this is an initiative that we've been doing now um, over the last three years, and um, it's been really quite fun. And uh, we've had um, lots of faculty and classrooms involved, both from uh, UBC Okanagan, UBC Vancouver, Simon Fraser University, as well as Capilano University. So long acronym here for the Teachers Project, training and engaging academics in their classrooms to positively impact health, education and resiliency of our students. So basically, based on what we already know in teaching, learning, health and well-being, we did targeted interventions in three course areas. So in course logistics, so things like um, course outlines, um, how the, the class is um, delivered um, and things like that. The second area of targeted interventions was in the instructor approaches. Um, so how they communicated intentional kindness, um, whether they, how they were doing their grading assignment, office hour practices, things like that. And then um, the third one was actually activities that were done in the classroom to support well-being. So this could have been intentional arrival, movement breaks, um, all sorts of different things. So within our project, we engaged a number of different faculty members who were keen. We had lots of different ideas within these three course areas. They chose what intervention that they wanted to do. We gave support and how they might adapt it so it fit best for their teaching style, the course they had, the type of students they had, um, you know, the, the teaching environment they were in. So very adaptable. And and also with their, their own, um, that fit with their own teaching comfort level. And the other thing that was really, really key that these were simple. You know, we have so much to do and so much to take care of in our course planning. And it's just like, okay, some tell me somebody, you know, what button do I press and let's just go. So through this project, we really wanted to give the faculty the, that quick support that they could literally take an idea and do this well-being implementation in their classroom, like basically in like a five, 10 minute lesson. So very, very quick and easy. And also for people, like it, it's been easy for me because health and exercise sciences and health is my area, area of expertise. However, it might not be, you know, second nature to somebody in chemistry or business or, or whatever. So um, if well-being isn't their area of expertise, then again, just tell me what button to press and away I go. So that's what we were also trying to do in this project was to give people that really, you know, hands-on support so you can get up and implement this in your classroom. So that's been the idea behind it. Um, we have done three years of this project with some really interesting um, results. Okay, next slide, please, Elisa. Okay, so I want to share some of the results with you. So one of the biggest things um, in the first rend rendition of this is that students noticed, students noticed that their, their, their professor was doing something to take care of their well-being. And that alone spoke volumes to the students because they said it said to them that, wow, my instructor actually cares about me. And just that alone facilitated their engagement in the class and, and helped with their, with their learning. So looking at my yellow box here, we also had a minimum of 70% of the students that completed all of the surveys um, stated that they either agreed or strongly agreed. We had a five scale Likert scale with each of the evaluation components on whatever the interventions that were done. 
just the numbers you see in that box, this was just from our last um, year. So our most current evaluation during the winter term of 2022. So just January to, to April of 2022. This is um, what the demographics looked like of uh, the students that were answering the questionnaires. So if we go to the other side of the screen, just explaining the results a little bit further, for each intervention that might have done, so as the targeted interventions that I explained a few minutes ago, we, we asked questions on the Likert scale, whether it whether they enjoyed the implementation. Did it help them focus in class or did it help them mo be motivated to learn? Did it help them engage with the class? Did they feel that their well-being was supported? Did it contribute to their sense of community in the classroom? And if in that classroom, that specific intervention wasn't done, would they maybe have wanted it in the class? Okay. So those were the evaluation um, components on the surveys. And um, we also then interviewed um, the faculty as well to find out their impact. And I'll tell you about those results as well. So just before I, we talk about the interventions, I, I just wanted to go back to the demographics of the, the students that answered. So mostly female, mostly white. Um, and I did want to highlight a, a about 12% did have either learning or some neurological disability, and almost 20% did indicate that they had some mental health issues. So we can see that that is a large portion of our student population. But, but interesting, with our last, um, when we went from our second to our third year of doing this study, one of the, there's a couple of kind of interesting results that came out and we really wanted to try to get um, an idea if these well-being interventions were received differently with different um, cultural and ethnic backgrounds. And so that's why in this last one, we really tried to identify um, ethnic and cultural background and, and also gender. But again, we didn't get um, huge diversity. Again, majority was white and then that rest 39% was sort of all over the map. So it made it really difficult, but I know as we're all working with um, sort of uh, uh, cultural and ethnic inclusion, we're talking about inclusion in our courses as that is a huge part of well-being and ties in with that sense of community. It is something to be um, cognizant of as we're doing these, um, these interventions, because we still, don't really know when what white what mm, losing my tongue here. Um, what we might see as a well-being intervention could be received differently or not perceived that way um, in a different cultural or ethnic background. So more lessons to be learned there. <laughs> All right, so the interventions that we were looking at and evaluating, we looked at movement breaks in the classroom um, and also this idea of standing. So just like I commented at the start of this workshop, we are standing friendly. Um, intentional arrivals. So things to do when the students are arriving at class, kind of making that transition. What are we doing when they are arriving to it? So helping them feel that okay, I've arrived at this class and I'm here. And, uh, you know, there's various different things that people did, you know, are they getting comfortable getting their water? Maybe they're having a discussion, maybe they're doing a, a little check in with happy faces, where is everybody today or um, something like that. Intentional kindness um, was another um, instructor approach that was um, um heavily implemented as well, um, linked with some other kindness research that we're doing. Um, some other things um, that were included in the interventions were being um, um, activities to really highlight an, an approachable instructor. We had other instructors uh, doing some flexible grading, flexible assignment due dates, some grading input, you know, students having input into how the grading for the course was done. And then also really focusing on course outline 
um, wording and structuring around that again to be uh, more inclusive, um, demonstrate the kindness, approachable. So kind of overlapping with some of those different things. So those were some of the interventions that have been done over the last couple of years. And again, what were evaluated in those comments above. Okay, I've been rambling a little bit here. Is there any questions that are popping up in, in the chat? Um, or does anybody have any questions that you'd just like to, to dive in or comment on right now before I continue? Elisa, can you see what's in the chat or anybody else? Any questions? Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. No. Nope. Okay. Anybody else? I'll give you a second just to pipe up or should we continue on? All right, okay, um, let's go to the next slide then, please. Okay, so when um, I just wanted to highlight, for some of you might know this, if not, here's a little um, uh, a lesson on the dimensions of well-being. And there are lots of different ways we can define the dimensions of well-being. You might be read one research article or textbook and it might put it into six or seven dimensions. Some other ones might divide it into eight or nine, whatever it might be. This picture that you're seeing here is divided into eight dimensions of well-being. So things that impact our well-being are physical. So things like um, sleeping, eating, exercising, occupational, and this might maybe fit in a little bit with our students. They're students right now, okay? So being challenged in, in that sort. Social, spiritual, just uh, spiritual has to do with their feelings of kind of, you know, I have a place in this world. Spiritual can also mean um, religious connection and community as well. Intellectual. So again, going back to feeling challenged that our knowledge is being used and that we're learning more. Environmental. And that can be everything for our immediate environment, meaning right in our classroom or where we live or the grander, bigger community of our environment and, and looking at um, and pollution and water and things like that. Our financial well-being and our emotional well-being, which links to sort of um, mental well-being might be another term that is used. So you'll notice that all of these circles are overlapping. And the reason they are is because every single dimension of well-being impacts the other. And we want to address all of our dimensions of well-being so we are well-rounded and even maybe if our physical well-being is challenged at a certain time, if we've worked on those other dimensions of well-being, then it might just help us put a little bit more effort into our physical well-being. So again, it's important to understand all the dimensions of well-being and understand this overlapping. So now when we kind of look at our goal here with you know, implementing something in our classroom to address well-being. We don't have to do something that's going to address all of these dimensions of well-being. But even if we're hitting one of them, because they all overlap and impact. So if you choose to do something around social well-being in your classroom, well, it's going to have impact on all of those other dimensions of well-being as well. So it's like, woohoo, you know? So even the 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 little thing that you do in your class doesn't take long. You're doing that, but it could have a much broader impact because of the overlapping nature of all of these dimensions of well-being. Does anybody have any questions or understanding of that? So again, just um, a little idea too, is that if, if students go to every single classroom or to every single class and their, their professor is somehow addressing something in that classroom to address their well-being, then think of the collective impact that we can have. So every single class a student is going to, their well-being is being supported. And, you know, if somebody is focusing more on emotional or somebody's focusing more on social or spiritual or physical or whatever it might be, then we're, we're hitting these students with all this support for their well-being. And collectively, again, it could really have a huge impact. So that's kind of the idea and my passion and the rest of the, the team's passion for doing this research, for, for demonstrating and sharing this information with you. 
Okay, any questions or comments um, around the dimensions of well being? I do a really fun activity with my students on the dimensions of, of well being and kind of, you know, we need a balance of all of these dimensions. And, and if we're not taking care of all of these dimensions of well being, then, um, you know, eventually, you know, the egg falls and it cracks. So we don't want anybody cracking. So, um, you know, we work on all of these dimensions of well being and it builds our overall resiliency. All right, next slide, please, Lisa. All right, so let's get to the nitty gritty here about embedding student well being practices into our classroom and our courses. So I kind of see this, you know, as we're writing our, our learning objectives for our, our courses, our classes, and in our course outlines. I'm kind of thinking that, you know what, this, this needs to be a foundational one for all of us, because if we're taking care of our students, then all of those other learning objectives that we set out for our course are more likely going to be achieved. So we saw in the research that the students are, for the most part, 70% are saying, yes, we want these, we enjoy them, we like them, it's helping us. But what does the faculty say? So when we were interviewing the faculty um, um, around doing these interventions, they found that they were very easy to implement that they felt um, you know, supported and they got help in doing the interventions, that it didn't take up time or major effort or take away um, instructional time within the classroom. And I know that's always a concern. They go, well, if I take three minutes to do a movement break or three minutes to do an intentional arrival, then is that taking away from my teaching time? And I've already got so much, right? And we also feel that, you know, we've, we've already got enough to do. Am I adding more to my plate? Again, that's why we want to make this super simple. And if we're taking that three minutes or two minutes or one minute to focus on well-being in the classroom, then it makes the students actually learn more efficiently. So if you take that one minute, yet it really is increasing or improving the efficiency of their of their um, of their learning. So the faculty that we had involved were also very supportive um, and uh, felt that this was very helpful and also a little bit of a rub off on their own health and well-being because if they are taking the initiative to do something for the classes then it did have a positive impact um, on the faculty and professors as well like not only like wow I feel like I'm doing something good for my students but it's also doing something good for me as a professor okay and we'll hear more about that um, when we hear from each of the um, professors that I've got presenting and sharing their implementations um, today. Okay. And again, just a little picture on the bottom of that slide um, has a lot to do with the different types of interventions that we were doing to connecting, social, being active, taking notice, learning, giving back, kindness, those types of things. All right. Okay, next slide, please, Elisa. Okay. So here we go. I would like to introduce the rest of my team that I have here today. So um, Tamara Freeman is from chemistry. She teaches basically every single first year chemistry student. So uh, she will have lots to share. Jamie Piercy in, in psychology, um, just lovely ideas, lots of different things she's done. Uh, Shirley Hutchinson, again, from psychology, and again, just a wealth of ideas and enthusiasm and positivity, um, being very, very helpful. Um, Lydia Watson, um, our crew from Capilano University, so I'm so happy that she's here today to share with us. And um, Brianna is actually um, in physical and well-being, um, a staff member here at UBC Okanagan. And uh, so she's going to be talking a little bit about um, more support for movement breaks in the classroom and then um, myself. And then I also just want to introduce um, my, the co-lead uh, on this research project was um, Yannick Ekenar from, from Engineering. And unfortunately, um, he's not here today, but fortunately for him, he's on holidays. So he's another great uh, contact and, and resource for you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite each of these um, lovely team members to share their implementation and experiences with what they did um, in the classroom. 
So let's go to the next slide, please, Elisa. Okay, Shirley, I've got you up first. So take it away, please. Thank you so much. And just before we get started, um, I just have had a couple of questions come into the chat. Um, just um, some individuals wondering about um, if the resources will be shared. So not only the recording from today, but also the PowerPoint. Um, and I sort of took the lead and said that they would be. So hopefully we yes, can make sure we do that. <laughs> um, but also, um, if we are able to also if we're able to get a participant list um, and able to email some resources too, um, there's just um, some interest in what the different types of strategies could be. So if we have a compilation of those, if we could share those as well, that would be very helpful. Okay, so perfect. hello everyone, my name is Shirley um, and I'm going to very briefly be talking to you about flexible grading options. Um, so to give some context in psychology, I teach the introductory uh, psychology courses as well as some second year and third and fourth year courses. Um, and one of the big issues I encounter with first year I mean, issue, I guess, is, the, is an interesting term because it depends how you look at it. But one of the struggles or challenges I have with first year is um, teaching to students that don't necessarily have psychology as their chosen interest. So psychology is a um, can be an elective course for a lot of students and doing it to kind of take those boxes, get those credits and move on. And so having students um, complete the courses, you know, a good chunk of them are really excited. They want to be there. They're thinking psychology long term. But there's another whole group that don't necessarily have interest in psychology. It's not top of their mind. They're just trying to get through. And so one of the issues I encounter in previous years um, had been, you know, I have all this content and stuff that I want them to do and to share and to engage with the material, but they're kind of just going through the motions because they're not really into it. It's not something of interest to them. And it, and a lot of the feedback I would get would be, you know, we had so many things we had to complete, so many quizzes, so many chapter reviews, and it's, it's not fun if you don't enjoy the material or you don't want to do the material. So one of the strategies I've used to kind of help with this a little bit is this flexible grading. So what you're seeing here on the slide um, is a breakdown. Um, I have an, um, a free online um, resource or online learning resource that my students can use, um, open access um, resource that goes into more depth on a few of the topics that we cover in our course. And so for a portion of the grade, in this case, it uh, represents 10% for this particular class. We have all of the different chapters. There's eight chapters that we cover um, in this course. And each one of those chapters represents a portion of their grade. But what we've done to make it more flexible and to allow for students to have um, sort of choice and, and to increase their engagement with the content and build these meaningful connections is allow them to choose which chapters they complete. So even though completing it is worth 10%, I might only ask them to complete five of those chapters or two of those chapters. And then the grades just break down as they would. And that allows a student who maybe goes through and goes, you know, I hate the history of psychology. I really struggle. There's names, there's you know, having to progress through a, a huge amount of time, which is not of interest to me. I'm not into it. I want to do something else. It gives them that option. And the feedback I've received from that has actually been really um, positive. The students really like to have the ability to kind of pick and choose, kind of create their own um, menu, if you will, of the things that they can do. And so um, the feedback's really great. It offers uh, flexibility for the students. It also gives um, some unintended flexibility where maybe a student who just doesn't have a time to tackle one of the chapters can just elect to not do that chapter at all and it gives them that flexibility and with these particular assignments i have them do at the very very end of the term so like at the start of the final exams so if a student wants to rate at the outset do chapters one two and three and get them done and be finished they can do that or if there's someone that maybe has a really tough semester and wants to wait until the end of the term they can do the latter ones there or decide to tackle those earlier chapters later on in the term so offering that flexibility so providing students with the option to complete some of the assigned activities as opposed to all of the activities i do the same thing with quizzes as well um and just helps the students engage with the content and build that meaningful connection for the stuff that they're actually interested in and it kind of helps a little bit with the i don't love psychology but i gotta get through it uh they have that ability to kind of say okay it's not my favorite but i'm going to focus on the things that are of interest to me okay that's it for me sally that's all i got all right. Thank you, Shirley. Any any comments or questions just for Shirley yeah, right off the bat? And we'll do more, more time for questions at the end as well. But is there anything coming up there? Lisa, do you see anything in the chat on that? Hi, this is Linda uh, Ackett yeah. from UBC Vancouver. My Hi. question is, how do you ensure that you meet your course outcomes if, if you have uh, pick and choose? That's an excellent question. So um, I ensure that by ensuring that the um, assessment, the actual midterm assessment, um, tackle all of those learning outcomes. So they do still have to be tested on all of the content in the course, whether they love it or they don't. But this is the secondary component of their grade that allows them to kind of focus more in on the stuff that they want. And as you can see, it's not worth a lot of the grade anyhow. It's similar to what a participation grade would be. So they 
meet those learning outcomes through studying through the content and engaging with the content through short answer or multiple choice on an exam, but then they have the ability to engage further with the material that's of interest to them. Got it. Thanks so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, thanks, Shirley. And maybe just another thing to add to that, like it's really neat um, how Shirley has done this sort of in topical areas, right, of what you're interested in not. Mm -hmm. Another way to also do the flexible grading is on the type of assessments you have. So if you have, Mm -hmm. you know, assignments and midterms and quizzes and various things and, and even to give a little bit of flexibility on how much each is worth. So say somebody knows they're a really good exam writer So maybe they want their exams to be, you know, to the high, maybe you give a range of like, you know, 5%, you know, 35 to 40% for this exam. I'm a really good exam writer. So I'm going to bump that up to 40% and maybe bump my assignments down by 5% or whatever. So that's another thing that you can do as well. Um, You know, some you might just keep, you know, the same. Um, some you might give that flexibility, but you give the r- percentage range that students can choose from. Mm-hmm. And again, even just the students seeing that they have a little bit of choice, it makes them feel that they've had more input, they have more ownership over it. Yeah. And again, even just that you presented the option, they might not take you up on it. And if they don't, then you just assume that everybody is going with the grading scheme that you have, mm-hmm. you know, set out there. And people are fine with that. But even just letting them know that you are flexible, it's they Mm -hmm. seem to be like, oh, okay, that's great. You know, Mm -hmm. Um, another thing, too, is um, with flexible due dates. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'll say, okay, well, this is the planned due date to help you progress through the course. But Mm -hmm. it's not set in stone. It's kind of the scaffolding. If you feel that you might need one or two more days because of this going on, then just email the TA. And I have found that students really rise to that. So Mm -hmm. if they realize like, wow, I've got five midterms that day, plus this, I'm just going to email my TA, but they, they are accountable because they have to have a plan and they'll go, okay, you you know, to the TA or Dr. Shelley, can I just have one more day because I've got this and this and this, and they will get it in on time. For, for that day. So it's another way of giving them ownership and them taking ownership mm-hmm. of their own learning. So just a couple of other ideas um, on that flexible grading. Idea. And actually, Sally, um, there's just been a question that's popped into the chat that relates okay. to what you were just discussing. So maybe you can help answer that too. Um, the question just relates to the flexible grading option and when you would ask them to have that decision by. So is it something that they can email you on like the day before or does it have to be done by a certain time period? Okay, good point. Thanks yeah, for reminding me of that. Yeah, so I give them a kind of a date where they need to decide. And um, <laughs> it's typically, you know, before their first assessment is due. So they can't, you know, change partway through or whatever. Um, so, you know, typically I'll give them maybe the first three weeks of classes to decide Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's either no response, then I'm just taking the instructor, what she has laid out, or if it's something different, then they just have to email it to the TA and the TA just takes note of it. And then all I do is at the end of the term, once all my final grades are tabulated, then I go back through and make those different calculations Mm -hmm. for, um, those students that had selected something different. And actually that's it. If you don't mind me, Sally, just building on that for just a second, that's one thing I should have mentioned. You'll see in the um, slide here, it'll um, in the canvas image, it shows a rule. Um, So what I've done here is um, you basically, in order to allow only a portion of them to be graded, you have to institute rules where they drop the lowest ones. And so that's what that's referring to. So all of them have been technically assigned in canvas so that anyone can access them, but then canvas goes through at the end of the term and and drops, say in this case, um, drop the five worst or three worst. Um, That's what that rule is. And there is a lot of flexibility with canvas to create rules like that and we do the same thing um a lot of us do the same thing with um quizzes as well in terms of like your worst quiz gets dropped or your worst um uh, assignment gets dropped so there's lots of flexibility in canvas too so i would encourage checking out canvas for what the rules are because there's a lot of flexibility with that as well yeah sorry a comment just came into the chat that relates to as well um i asked a question on the oh sorry it's Tamara. sorry yeah exactly yeah that's exactly and maybe you can speak to that too tomorrow during your session Yeah. All right. Okay. Thanks, Shirley. Yeah. So lots of neat ideas that you can do here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. All right. Okay. Jamie. 
Hi. Um, well, thank you. So nice to be able to speak on this topic. I'm going to speak broadly about intentional wellness and kind of themes of wellness and you know, approach and warmth and all of these things in the classroom. And then also the structural interventions of how over the last three years on this project, I have uh, implemented some of these strategies. So in terms of wellness, I'm um, just for background, I'm actually a clinical psychologist. And so here at UBC, I teach the psychopathology series. So I teach um, the psychopathology class for adults, as well as abnormal um, behavior in children or different, you know, child clinical diagnostics, uh, as well as the development series. And so a lot of the focus on wellness is actually really central to exploring topics that may be personal for some students. So many young adults are starting to experience anxiety or they have had a history of, of learning or mood concerns. And so a lot of the focus in the classroom is on wellness and compassion and really the pillars of mental health and wellness. And so making that really explicit is actually quite easy in my in my classes. But I would really emphasize in general, a successful implementation or strategy is the one that you will actually do. The one that doesn't seem like a lot of work, um, that just really fits in with your style. So I personally am really passionate about mental health and wellness. And so focusing on the health of the students and talking about that um, really explicitly has seemed to be really effective. Uh, so having that kind of warmth and, and approachability is, is fairly central, as well as supporting mental health themes explicitly. So when we get into more difficult topics, I will always re-remind students of the mental health resources on campus, both in class, in slides, and um, on the Canvas site. And I think it's really important. In terms of arrival, so I do intentional arrivals on occasion. So I will um, talk about the, the success in terms of compartmentalizing and be where you are when you're there. And so I will usually tell students to check your phones, think about that message that you need to send or that friend you want to reach out to or that last comment you want to make and then be here, you know, respect myself, but also respect each other and just be here for the next 30 minutes until we take our first break um, and lots of those kind of check in. So arrivals are yes, compassionate and, and to notice, you know, we're going to talk about eating disorders today, for example, what are your gauge, your initial reactions, your initial feelings on that topic, and, and just know that you're in a place where um, it's safe to have those feelings, but also to let me know if I can support you further in, in terms of just being in this space for the next short period of time. Um, the topic also allows for a lot of emphasis on community, um, community within the classroom and this idea of, I, I spend an extraordinary amount of time learning all their names, uh, which sounds basic, but I teach 300 students at a time. And the amount of students who thank me for learning their name or even for asking their name in the classroom, I think it just shows like I noticed that you're here and I want you to be here. And um, it ends up becoming a joke when I immediately call. There was a, I had a Jill last term who I called Meg probably 40 times. And every time the class would laugh and you know, we, humility, but also um, just having a relationship with them within those 80 minutes. So that's kind of my wellness in the class. If you don't mind going to the next slide for me, Elisa, thank you. Um, and then structurally, there's a few things that I do as well. Um, the syllabus, I know that Eva, you were asking earlier about um, approachable in the syllabus. I will often do a small intro um, in the syllabus, like a line or two about, you know, welcome to the class. Here's what we're hoping to kind of learn on the Canvas site in hybrid learning. That was also really central. So an introduction to me, what I like, whether that's on the discussion board or just an intro to the professor and the teaching assistants. Um, I do do movement breaks. I personally am an incredibly fidgety person. So I pace the whole time and I can't imagine sitting still for that long. So I usually do about a 40 minute uh, stretch, check your phone kind of um, check in, but also just depending on how glazed over any eyes are. Um, and then in terms of the actual course itself, I also do flexible grading. So 
10 drop two in terms of, of quizzes just to lower the anxiety and the approach to um, a quiz, I think sometimes can be problematic. And then including lower stakes um, exams and assignments. So I usually have at least three exams in my class that start at a lower percentage. So maybe a 20, a 25, and then a 30 or a 35, and then have grades um, based on quizzes that have flexible grading or other more applied assignments that are enjoyable, but lower in terms of the grade percentage. I always wanna focus on the process of learning as opposed to the avoidance or fixation on a grade. Um, so that's the, what I've incorporated. I think generally it's been really effective. Learning what's not effective has been really helpful too. Um, I don't do standing desks. I do movement breaks. Standing desks, psych students don't like them. <laughs> I've tried. And I think it's uncomfortable to have like a one person standing in the audience and then everybody around. Anyways, that's more of a, a me thing and the psych students. Um, and just kind of doing what seems the most authentic to you and what you'll actually remember to do because over time it will just shape your teaching style um, to becoming less of an intervention and just more of an approach. Um, so that's all that I have planned, but I welcome any questions. Uh, I really care about this stuff and so I'm more than happy to discuss here or via email if that would be more helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. And I just, I, I just love your comment about you know, you got to do the intervention that you're actually going to do, right? Yeah. I'm sure, you know, when we're all trying to, you know, be more active, well, you know, you're not going to go to the gym if you hate going to the gym, but if you like right. walking, well, then you're going to walk, right? So it's the same type of thing here, right? Something you'll remember that you enjoy doing and that that fits with you. So right. that's lovely. Thank you so very much. No problem. Okay. Can we go to the next slide, please, Elisa? Okay, so Lydia from Capilano University, it's been so fun to have um, Lydia and the whole crew there involved with this research study as well, and uh, being in North Vancouver, my hometown, so yeah, so thank you Lydia so much for being here and sharing your really neat idea. Yeah, thank you, Sally, and thank you, everybody. Um, so yes, as Sally said, um, I, and I am actually coming to you today from the lands of the Shishalt people in the Sunshine Coast. I do live on the Sunshine Coast and teach both in North Vancouver and um, at our Shishalt Kaplan University campus. So I've actually never met Sally or any of the members of the Unity <laughs> team in person, uh, but it's been lovely over the last two years to be working with this team. Uh, I think that's one of the wonderful parts of this project is there's just been this amazing ripple effect um, where we've been talking about it at, at the institution I, that I work at, and I've been, <clears throat> along with three other colleagues, uh, part of this project. So this is um, a, a snapshot of uh, something that I do, and it's called a wishes and worries wall. And this is, I do it in two uh, ways. I'll, I'll do it at the beginning of a course. So this is actually for communications. I teach communications and business, and it's communications 100 course. A lot of students come into this course uh, not really being scared about writing, being scared about public speaking. And so I ask them, you know, what are your hopes for this course? What do you hope to get out of it? And then what are your, what are your worries? What are your concerns? And as you can see, one of the things that this does is it and and you know of course it is anonymous i've been teaching online as as all of us have the last couple of years or many of us have um and but of course you can do this in a face-to-face -face as well and, and i think that anonymous piece is really important uh, because it does give the students freedom to take risks in their learning and put themselves out there when they may have not normally been doing that in a face-to-face -face class and especially when they are being vulnerable and and um you know putting up things like you know that they're you know worried about the grammar and editing or the group projects that sort of thing the unfair division which are you know common concerns we know students have so it creates this community right away oh you think that too. I, I feel better knowing that you know you uh, you feel the same way. Um, and then I also do a wishes and worries wall. And if you could please go to the next slide, this is um, one from uh, just a regular just this is a Zoom whiteboard. So I'll do it weekly as well. And so students start to get the idea that, you know, at the beginning of each week, they're going to, you know, put out what they're feeling. And I chose this one. Sometimes I might get maybe one or two. This one was, was a really good one. I chose it because you can see that a lot of other things come out besides just con concerns around the course. 
lack of sleep, assignment overload, not getting the work done. And then there's also, um, you know, people who are saying thank you for this, which is great feedback for me, right, to know that this is actually working. And I should say just along the lines of feedback, the, the great thing about these, you know, these types of check-ins is it also gives you feedback in terms of, you know, what's working, what are the students worried about, what can you maybe tweak and change. Um, and you can, you know, go back and say, hey, I heard this and it is in my purview to change it. And I changed it based on your feedback. So it's it's very empowering for them to, to hear that. So, you know, as, as um, has already been said there, you know, there are multiple other things that I would implement into my classes, including intentional kindness um, and, you know, some some work, some language on the course outlines and on our um, LMS sites. But this one I wanted to share with you because I thought it was just a really easy, quick way uh, to get feedback from students right away. So that's all I have to say. I don't know. I see Zoom whiteboards aren't anonymous, are they? Uh, that's a really good question, Linda. Yeah. So you can enable it at the beginning to make sure it is anonymous. So that's a good point. Do make sure that you do that or else you will see people's names pop up. So thank you. I don't know if there are any other questions, but that's yeah, um, any that other helpful. comments for Lydia. It's just it's a really neat idea. I've had lots of fun discussions about her and I just I love the name, too. It's just like it's just very authentic and just like let's put it out there. And I just want to, as we've seen and heard from a few team members here about the implementations, I sort of want you to think back about the um, dimensions of well-being diagram that we had talked about earlier in this presentation and just thinking about how all of these different things have sort of addressed different areas of well-being but understanding like again those dimensions and, and how they're overlapping so again if I went to Lydia's class and I got this and then I went to Jamie's class and I got this you see how we're getting these little snippets of you know all of those dimensions of, of well-being being being hit so, Lee just asked a really good question oh, um, in the yes, chat go ahead. um and it yeah do you respond to student concerns immediately like open up discussion about them or just let them be other that's a really good point so um based on the context based on the class um I I may I may I may like for example I I do this I remember this one and I remember the lack of sleep and I did talk about it and I did um, you know, make sure that I sent them a follow up email talking about the importance of sleep and how we have supports on campus. We have free counseling. Um, so I, I do. Yes, especially if there are some of those comments that are quite um, where I feel like, you know, they should be followed up with. I, I definitely will do that. Oh, yeah, that's a great idea. Some um, Lucy just said, make it a you could come up, make it a sm snowball fight with different colored paper for the wishes and worries. For sure, you can do a ton of different things with this. Great. Oh, idea. yeah, so fun. Like you could write them on paper and then scrunch them up and throw them, right? I mean, think of that building that sense of community, right? And let's just throw our worries away. And yeah, so again, sometimes when we act out those things, it's just the, um, uh, uh, oh, what's the, the, the word of you know, just, just doing that, right. Just doing that action of throwing it away. Like the physical action sometimes can, can help too. And again, it's, it's fun. And why shouldn't learning be fun? <laughs> All right. Next slide, please. All right. Okay. Tamara, this is you. I forgot to put your name up there. Sorry about that. I think <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> So maybe a little background on me. Um, yeah, from the chemistry department, and I teach the required first year chemistry course. So that is um, every single bachelor of science student that comes into my course, and we average somewhere between 700 to 800 students a year. I teach two sections of approximately 400 students each to hit that 800 total. So big, big classrooms. Um, I'm very lucky that I teach in a classroom that was designed for active learning. Uh, so I have the ability to engage my students. One of the things, again, coming from that science background, is that we are taught in all of our scientific writing that it is supposed to be impersonal. It is never I or we. It is always the experiment did this. So this was not a huge leap for me to create these syllabi with language that is inclusive um, or welcoming. It actually became more of an addiction. 
<laughs> once you start to make one change and you see how the positive results come in, you, you start making other ones. So one of my very favorite pieces of my syllabus now is letting students know that this is a course where, again, it's a required course, just like Shirley ha highlighted in her first year course. Not everyone's there because they want to be a chemist long term. They eventually have some other goal in mind. So encouraging them to make meaningful connections with the material. And that statement I get all the time when I introduce myself, oh, you're a scientist. Oh, I hated chemistry in high school. And you don't have to enjoy my course at the end. You have all of these student rights, which I highlight right away at the beginning of my syllabus. You have the right to be confused. You have the right to think this is uh, confusing and make mistakes and then coming and seeing me. So in that statement, I follow that very clearly with the introduction of myself. I'm going to echo Jamie here in her comments about being true to yourself, making sure you introduce yourself in a way that is personal to you and that you and you aren't trying to be something you're not. I'm klutzy in the classroom. I make mistakes in the classroom. I tell funny stories. I show pictures of my silly kids. Um, I have one of the most recent implementations for my inclusive syllabus is I now take a video of myself. Um, I've done Instagram videos where I run around campus and I introduce students to the classroom and I send that to them the week before class starts. So all of these practices, it is still the syllabus in my brain, but you're starting to incorporate that approachable instructor, that inclusive, that community piece. Um, replacing the impersonal language. It wasn't as hard as I thought it was going to be. Every time you have your course syllabi jargon, the student should just simply changing it to you can do this and you will be introduced and I will help you learn have all been statements that have been really powerful. Um, I was just looking through my syllabus here on the side. And one of the things um, I, I very specifically tell my students, I believe that everyone can be successful in this course. And I have an entire section of my course syllabus that says plan your success. It's got all those pieces. Here's how a lecture is run. Here's how the active learning will be. Here's how my grading modules are going to occur. But it's all of the pieces highlighting to those students what they need to do so they can be successful. Um, as a first year instructor, seeing all of these first year students in sciences, um, one of the things I've come to realize is that it's really not about the course content for these students as much as it is about teaching them how to be students. So another thing that I also really like to include in my syllabus, and actually this one I've just revamped as I'm editing my syllabus for September, is describing the purpose of your office hours. A lot of students don't come. I sit there for hours and hours. Students, come and see me. I swear I'm here to answer your questions. And no one comes. And often it's time that students don't really know what an office hour is meant to be. So renaming it student hours or instructor availability. And what I've done just recently this year is telling students, hey, this is the time to ask me questions about content, about career progression, about why my kids are pains in the butts. You know, <laughs> how did I get to this career? How did I become the instructor that you see today? All of these are questions that you might have if you're interested in research. So ways to use office hours and how to get um, into them without having to, you know, feel like there's those emails that come in. I'm so sorry to bother you. You're not bothering me. This is my job. <laughs> I love doing this. Um, yeah, so that's the piece that I wanted to highlight. I, I think I did say, you know, it does become addictive. You start to see how easy it is to incorporate one thing and then you start to incorporate more. Um, one more thing I wanted to bring in in terms of flexible grading. Another thing that I've recently come to, and it's again, it's speaking on wellness for the students. Very specifically, it became something important uh, wellness for myself is I've incorporated what we call flex days into my syllabus. We all know that we have a lot of content to cover in a, in a limited amount of time, but if you're not healthy and your students aren't healthy, you're not gonna make it through the syllabus content anyways. So finding time in your syllabus, any time in your syllabus that, you know, this can just be a review day. I might just cancel this class altogether to give everyone a mental health break. Um, finding the time in your syllabus to create what I like to call flex days has been immensely um, positive and helpful for myself as well. So I think I'd like to I'd like to leave it there and I'm open to any questions.
Lovely. Thank you so very much, Tamara. And I just, I just hope you guys are getting goosebumps and tons of inspiration because even when I'm hearing like all these ideas over again, when I'm talking to my team and there's just, just, just so many um, great ideas and, and things coming out. And, and I know when we were switching that language, it's just so fun. Like I have welcome messages on my um, thing, but I really like that um, idea, Tamara, about not putting office hours. Like I've done the explanation because I, I literally had some students you're right. They don't know what, well, what is office hours, right? But, um, um, and I really noticed that it was interesting that during COVID, when my office hours were virtual, every single office hour was packed. And I thought, well, this is really interesting. Like what's different here? So yeah, some some neat ideas. And two, I think the, the one thing about these rights of a learner too, again, um, I, I just think those are so, so valuable with really breaking down that barrier between students thinking that professors are these pedestals up here on stage and we can't ask them questions. But I think those rights of the of the learner really help them realize like, no, like we are your team leader here. We're your cheerleader. And I actually write that on my course outline beside, you know, where it says course professor and you start putting all your information. I put in brackets, your cheerleader, your team member, your, you know, your go-to support person, you know, because I want you to be successful. I want you all to be getting 100% of my course, right? And I don't think they see that. Often they see, you know, you as the instructor trying to give, be as hard on them and, you know, give them the lowest grade possible. Like, no. So anyway, so just some fun ideas there. Okay. So, oh, thanks, Tamara, for putting that, that link in there. Um, that's great. That's really helpful for everybody. Um, yeah, and no such thing as a stupid question. Absolutely. It's their safe environment to ask the questions. Do it in the safe environment here before you're out in your in your career. Lovely. Thank you so very much, Tamara. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. All right, Brianna, let's uh, hear a little bit more about the um, the the move you breaks and initiatives. Hey, thank you so much. I'm just going to add um, some links in the chat. Perfect. Thank you. And then I'll give you a little bit more context later on as well. So hi, everyone. My name is Brianna, and I'm the Physical Activity and Wellbeing Coordinator here at UBC Okanagan Athletics and Recreation. I'm going to be explaining about how you can actually implement movement breaks into your class. This is also open to all students and staff as well. It doesn't have to be requested for just a class, but a meeting or even an event. So I'm going to try to multitask and lead you through a stretch break because it's been an hour as I try to explain what the movement breaks are. So I really encourage you to just follow along with me. We're gonna start with a little bit of a neck stretch. And I'm gonna try to attempt to talk while doing this. So hold it here. So I'm in charge of supervising the MoveView crew, um, which is health and exercise sciences uh, students here. So switch to the other side, uh, UBC Okanagan, as well as some students from our exercise is medicine club here at UBCO. I know Vancouver also has um, a MoveView crew. Um, so I really encourage you if you're on the Vancouver campus to check out the UBC recreation department there and you can um, find them in the link I share. We're gonna do some, um, rest stretches here. Um, so as shown in the teacher's project, um, as well as the implementations and from Dr. Sally Stewart's research, um, movement breaks really improve well-being by alleviating stress, improving mood, increasing energy, and also making students more engaged and focused while in their class. Um, and so now some shoulder shrugs, some will go forward. And of course, feel free to modify any of these movements um, based on your own abilities. So um, here at UBC Okanagan, we're actually piloting this for the first time. Um, and it's actually been implemented at UBC Vancouver. And then you can switch and roll back your shoulders. Um, so in the links that I provided you, you'll be able to request a five to 10 minute movement break from the Move View crew for your class, meeting, or event. Um, and now I encourage everyone to actually stand up if you can. Um, we'll do some arm circles just to loosen up our arms. 
Um, so you'll be able to find a request form. It's actually not launched at UBC Okanagan yet, but I'll be launching it in September. So as a faculty, you'll be able to um, schedule a movement break for um, your class time, whether whatever that class may be. So you'll be able to schedule the day of your class and the time and the movie crew can come and implement a movement break there. I know you can't see me, but try marching on the spot now to really loosen those legs. Um, and from there, you can request whether you want a stretch break, an aerobic break, or a dance break. So you can really cater it to whatever you think would work with your class. Um, you can also make this reoccurring as well. So not only you can make it a one off where you could have the movie crew come to one class, but you can make it reoccurring where they come to class biweekly or every week um, throughout the semester as well. And what's really great is that you don't have to lead the movement break. We'll have the movie crew come and lead the movement break for you. So it's a really great way to um, break up sedentary behavior um, and really increase engagement in your classroom as well. Um, so specifically at UBC Level Recreation, you can find um, more about our movement breaks on the Get Active page. And in the link I provided, if you're on the Vancouver campus, you can find a little bit more about requesting it there. And the process is very similar on both campuses as well. And if you're also more interested in learning more about it, you can email myself directly. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so very much, Brianna. And um, I think it's really neat there that you you did your presentation while we were moving, because one of the things about doing movement breaks in, in the classroom and the concern I mentioned earlier, we're going, oh my gosh, but this is going to take up so much time. You can use your movement break as um, as still instructional time. You can have people stand up while you explain, you know, and move around while you explain a concept. Or the other thing that you could do too is, um, you know, do the think, pair, share, or while you're standing up and moving, um, you know, explain, you know, take turns explaining this concept to um, to your, your partner. Because, you know, once you can explain a concept and verbalize it, then you know you know it. So you can also use that movement break time for actually you know, learning sort of course content stuff. Um, and even if you can have them, you know, I've had my students walk around the classroom, like in some of those big lecture theaters, like, okay, well, we're doing laps around and, um, you know, talking away, answering questions, movement break time to discuss, um, you know, whatever concept you're, you're discussing in the class. So you can use it as a complete mental break, or you can actually use it for teachable moments as well. So thank you very much, Brianna. So um, lovely, the movement breaks has been very successful on the Vancouver campus. Um, so some of you might be very familiar and have used it. So trying to get them more implemented here at UBC Okanagan. So again, very helpful for people where movement isn't your thing, or you don't feel comfortable leading it in your class. You know, you can um, have this crew come to your classes. The other thing, um, when I talk a little bit more, there are some other opportunities for movement breaks in the classroom as well, um, which I will talk about here in just a minute, because I think my little interventions are up next. So let's go to the next slide, Elisa, and we're just watching the time here. All right. So a couple of things that I, I want to mention to you that I do. So one of the things that I do is an intentional arrival. So this was mentioned earlier, just a slightly different version. So basically, when students come to my class, this slide is up. So whether we were online or in person in the classroom, this is up. And I explain it the first day. And it might take a few minutes the first day. But then as the students start getting into the hang of it, it really ends up taking no time at all because the students are doing this you know, or have done it by the time you're starting your class. And you could take this slide and, and you know, modify it for what is best for you. But these little ideas here are, you know, do what you need to do well and, and healthy in this class. So do you like to stand? We're a standing friendly class. So if you need to stand, you can stand and stand up here or do your, um, um, you know, your, your standing desk there. Some of the classrooms do have that. Some of the classrooms on the Okanagan campus actually do have those cardboard boxes. Um, and so the picture of the standing there. Um, I also encourage um, if people need a snack, you know, we cannot think 
and work and learn if we do not have a well-fueled brain. So water bottles, do they have a snack? Um, and again, uh, as long as it's not a messy or smelly one, then they need to bring it to share for the whole class, but um, absolutely they can eat is fine. There might be different regulations in certain classrooms where no, no food is allowed. Um, again, as Jamie mentioned about the phones is um, like, oh my gosh, like, okay, like, let me just, you know, like put this away, or I don't need to, to reply. I know that text message or my friend is going to be there when I finish class. So putting those phones away. And so you can be here and focus in the class. And the other thing that I really find that helps with that is having the students do a to-do list and whether they do it on their phone or actually write it down because they might have been coming from another class going, oh, I have to remember to get that textbook or, or do this online thing or get this quiz or whatever it might be. So if they write it down, they know it's taken care of, put it aside, now I can be present here in the class. So just some little tips like that, again, and it's all about making that transition. Can I be in this class and comfortable and ready to learn and be present and mindful? So um, that was just um, sort of my idea of an intentional arrival. And um, again, you could take this idea and modify it for whatever is appropriate for your classes, um, your students and things like that, or what you think is important. So, all right, uh, next one, please. The other thing that I often did with intentional arrivals is um, I really like quotes. And so often I would do a, a, a quote with a picture up there and it might have been related to our class content or just anything about well-being or, or anything. And that was also another way just to um, get students to be to be thinking um, about well-being and make that transition into their classroom. All right. Next slide, please, Elisa. OK. The next one I want to talk about is intentional kindness. And actually, I was doing another project. Um, some of you may have heard of Dr. Binfit on the Okanagan campus, does the research with the dogs, but also kindness research. And so we have done some kindness research together as well to try to look at how our university students um, see kindness. And just on the bottom of the slide there, this was typically what came out of the results from that study was students thought that kindness was helping others, doing something for others, you know, being polite, using kind words, showing compassion. And um, just that idea, people want to be cared for. If we go back to, I'm sure we all know Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Um, knowing that we are, are cared for and, and loved, that's one of the things about being part of a family or a community, um, feeling wanted is one of those basic um, foundational needs. And um, by share, showing kindness to others, that is a way of showing um, people that we do care. It's kind of interesting. I think um, kindness has come a little bit more to the forefront over the last number of years because of COVID, um, because of, of inclusion, the um, anti-bullying days, um, day of reconciliation, all of these things are sort of really um, bringing again kindness out into the forefront, which is lovely to see. Um, but again, it's something that we can absolutely do in our classrooms. And it it doesn't mean changing your personality. We are who we are, but even it could be intentional kindness in terms of how we word things on our course outline, how we address students when they come into our class or into our office hours. Um, that that wording, again, can be really, really critical. Um, it just acknowledging if, if, if students are asking a question or, or, or sharing something, it's just acknowledging about how they feel and, and what can you do to inspire kindness, make kindness the norm. One of the things that I, I do in my class is um, I have always four course themes that relate to the course. And I can, I can, I'm not sure if I put a slide in here on that or not, but always my last and fourth course theme is grace and kindness. So if I'm teaching nutrition and I'm wor working with my, my students about on, you know, working with a client with um, nutrition challenges, then how can we approach that with kindness? And um, uh, even just about if you're doing a group project together, how can you bring kindness into your group leadership? So it's just in whatever we do, put kindness in there. 
Um, and can we act from a, from a way of kindness? So it becomes a norm. It becomes our way of being. It becomes a way of our community in the classroom is around kindness. Um, and um, uh, what else was I going to say about that one? Oh, one interesting thing, though, that did come out of our research is when the students were asked about you know, this intentional kindness and about if you would have wanted this, if you felt that this wasn't an implementation that your professor did. And some students actually replied, no. And I'm going, why wouldn't anybody want their professor to be kind? And so I kind of grappled with this a little bit and it's come out on the last two years, a very small proportion, but still, if anybody says, no, I don't want my professor to be kind, I don't get it. So I'm wondering if there is some cultural ethnic thing there that is that is coming out and I don't know but I'm just wondering and maybe it's you know where I'm here to learn I don't care how nice or mean my professor is <laughs> but anyways again um that uh that kindness just does show um show and care so hopefully I've given you a couple of different ideas about where you can bring um kindness into that can you go to the next slide please Elisa I'm just okay so I, I didn't show you a slide about my four course themes, um, but I, I do them with relative pictures and I encourage the students to print them off and put it up in their study area. So when they ever kind of lose sight of what we're doing in the class, it sort of comes back to those four, four, four themes and that grace and kindness always does come up. And I'll just reflect back on what Tamara said, like, you know, yeah, we all goof in the classroom. We absolutely do. So I'm asking you, meaning the students, for your grace when I goof or I'm a minute late, this happened or whatever. And I will also show you that grace as well. And maybe that grace comes into, um, you know, the the um, the idea around scaffolding or slightly um, flexible on due dates. Okay, things like that. All right. There's, there's so much, um, but I'm really hoping that this has given you a little bit of an idea. Um, the movement breaks, again, is another one that I do, obviously, coming from health and exercise sciences. It's where I really started um, in doing the movement breaks. And again, but so many other well-being interventions um, are, are coming in to play now. And I will be showing you some resources um, just in the next couple of minutes of where you can access, um, uh, again, ideas for movement breaks where you can access a dozen different three minute videos that you can show in your class for, for doing movement breaks. Um, the whole idea about standing friendly, stand up desks, um, those types of things as, as well. Um, just lost my train of thought there for a second. Um, all right. Okay. Maybe that one, that, that thought will come back to me. All right. We just have, um, uh, uh, a couple of minutes left. I just do see one question in the, the chat here that I will answer right away. It says, how long do you give them to fully arrive and be present? Okay, really good question, Sue. And again, sometimes, um, you know, once they get into the swing of doing an intentional arrival, if you tend to do, you know, um, a very similar one each time, eventually, really, I'm kind of maybe just giving them a minute if that and um or sometimes I'll have them kind of still doing their intentional arrival maybe where I'm while I'm just getting set up some days it might take a little bit longer but maybe they've just had a week of like exams or you had your exam last class and maybe it just takes sometimes you just have to read your class a little bit okay so let's flip this over to you I'm hoping that you're getting excited some ideas feeling inspired about this so um, I'm just going to open up the chat or if people want to speak up, please do. These are just some of the questions that I've kind of thrown out to you here about, um, uh, you know, what sort of is your in inspiration? What questions do you have? Um, anything like that. So we'll take a few minutes here before we get into the closing and, and the, the resources. Okay, anything in the chat or does anybody want to ask? 
Okay. Um, one here. I'd love to look into the research supporting the notion that students learn better as a result of these movement breaks. Could you share these relative resources? Absolutely. Irene, I would be very happy to. Um, some of them we do have on the Wellbeing website. And um, I'm also very happy to speak with you individually because those were my research um, uh, things as well. So I'm just going to write down um, your name as well. Okay. Um, research. Okay, lots of comments about love the tips, add to classes. The, the other thing too that I want to comment on is um, you, you know that we've put everybody's um, links up there and mine and Yannick's. And so we just really encourage you, we would love to hear from you. If there's something that really is kind of tweaking you, just email us. We can have a short phone chat and help you maybe modify something that would be work wonderful for you in, um, in your class. I'm seeing another question here. Is the teacher's project an ongoing research study or has it been completed? Uh, will it be published? Okay, very keen to learn more. Okay, so we have done three years. We have not published anything. My main goal, and I think the team's main goal, is about disseminating it. We want to get it out to you. We want to, we want to activate it and um, get people engaged. And so we're feeling that through these CTL workshops, um, getting our names out there through the Education Leadership Network, whatever we can, we want people to, and it's also on um, the UBC Wellbeing website, which I'll show you. We're hoping that by getting the word out, um, talking about it, um, putting us out there in these CTL workshops that will get people interested so we can meet with them and just keep this ripple effect going, right? So if you go to this workshop and you hear about it, say, okay, we'll contact Jeannie or Sally or whoever and get some input on it. We're not sure whether we're going to do another um, cohort of the actual research this year yet or not. Um, we're looking at some other options of disseminating. That's our big key is, you know, we've seen some really positive results. I mean, when you've got over 70 percent saying yay this is great then my goal is to really get it out there I'm really hoping that we can do some work with the deans and directors and get kind of key people in each of the different faculties to help faculty members and professors actually implement in their classrooms so um so that's what I'm really hoping for and, and putting emphasis on Um, and we do have one manuscript that's prepped to submit. Yes, that's right, Jamie. Thank you. Yeah, it's ready. We just got to get it in there. We just got to <laughs> send it in. I think it just shows how busy everybody has been, but it definitely is just needs to be polished and submitted. So soon it will will exist, but we're happy to discuss anything in the in the meantime before it's in press. Yeah. Thanks, Jamie. Anything else here? Um, okay, any specific tips that will be good for our key COVID cohorts? Um, you know, again, Lucy, I think really is um, our students are stressed and the mental um, aspects have gone up significantly. And I think one of the things is to really reflect on your teaching styles and what you're teaching. Sometimes even doing the um, teaching perspectives inventory, if you haven't done that already, can be very, very helpful on identifying what um, teaching perspective you come from. And it might actually really, really help you decide on what to do from your class. Because again, anything that you do that authentically is coming from you as a professor, showing that you care about your students is probably the number one thing that's students need to know that they're going to a safe place and you know I was involved in um, some workshops um, this summer and one presenter actually kind of summed it up as that school is basically like home and if we think of what home really means to us home is our safe place and if we've got students maybe that do live in Vancouver or Kelowna or wherever their, their home campus is, but we also have students coming from all over the world. And now UBC, UBC Okanagan is their new home. The classroom is their home. And as professors, we're almost like the parents in that classroom. And so a home is where students feel safe and supported and gently nudged and challenged. And again, so anything I think that we can do 
to make the students feel safe in that environment. So I, I just really like that analogy that that school is literally like a second home to these students. And so how can we we make it feel comfortable? So I really like that analogy. It, it kind of hit home with me, pun intended. <laughs> Um, okay, seeing some comments about um, the grading practices. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's the one more thing. We don't want to overload those to-do lists. So that's that's a key thing there. Maybe, Elisa, if you could go back to the screen share and I'll just follow up with those last couple of slides that um, have the resources on it. Yeah. Okay, so a couple of resources here that I would like to highlight. And again, you will get be getting these slides. So the first one on the top right there is that uh, on the UBC Wellbeing website, the tools and resources for teaching and learning, those have specific resources in there. You will see the one on the teacher's project. There's examples and there's our research study results on there. The Move You Crew, there's the Take a Stand policy, the Random Acts of Exercise videos, and there's so many more about you know, like a, a yoga or a stretch video or so there's so many tools and resources for teaching um, on well-being. So please go to that website. And again, you might find something that's really going to hit home for you. The next resource that I do want to share with you, I'm sure all of you know that November is Thrive Month on campus. And again, I just want to highlight it. We're already planning for these events. But again, during Thrive Month, really watch for the resources that are sent out to you. And the Thrive Five are about moving more, sleeping well, eating well, connecting and giving. So again, that might just give you some, some ideas, some themes, some other resources for things that you can do in your classroom. The other wonderful resource for you here is um, um, the website from Simon Fraser University. They have been real leaders in campus well-being and have also looked um, a great deal at the learning environment. So again, that website there for healthy campuses is, is a um, really good one. And again, remembering um, all of the team here today that um, has helped me present. We are so, so um, open and welcome to, to hear from you and work with you individually. That would be wonderful. Um, okay, next slide, please, Elisa. There we go. Last one. I'm just um, hopefully that you are feeling inspired. Thank you for caring for your students. Thank you for taking this time. And again, remember what you're doing for your students also helps your well-being. OK, that that giving um, little analogy there of um, school is our home. And um, I just thank you so much for your participation. We do have a couple of minutes left. Um, I'll hang around if there is anything else. Um, yeah, so thank you. And thank you, Elisa, for helping us um, facilitate and, and the technology. And again, thank you to everybody for, for taking your time out today. I know it's a very, very busy time of, of year. <laughs>